Let's open up our Bibles to once again to John chapter six, John, the sixth chapter. And as you open up your Bible, you know, I was reminded of I saw a commercial the other day from uh, Coca-Cola and um, I don't how many people here enjoy Coke every so often. I mean, Coca-Cola every so often. Um, <laughs> but uh, they have a slogan that I thought was really cool. And it's and it goes like this, open happiness, open happiness. In other words, they want us to believe that as soon as you open a bottle of Coke, you're going to enjoy happiness. You're going to feel happy. But the truth is, is they stole that from God and from the Bible, because the truth is, is real open happiness comes when you open your Bible. When you open your Bible, that's when you're going to find real happiness. That's when you're going to find real joy. When you open the word of God and find out the treasures of God's word, that's where real joy and happiness comes from. So get ready to be happy. Get ready to open happiness as we open our Bibles to John chapter six. Now we're talking about the miracles of Jesus, but the the first miracle that Jesus did was found in John chapter two. Does anybody know what it was? We talked about it last week. What was it? Hama, hama, hama. Some of you speaking in tongues. That's good. But do that later. He turned the water into wine, but we called that the miracle of transformation. Thank you for the one person that was listening to me last week. Now, now in the miracle of transformation, when Jesus turned water into wine, he told the he told the servants at the wedding to take the water and fill water, fill the water pots with water. And they were water pots that were like the size of these water pots that literally are the size of a human being. They were that big. They were six. Uh, they, they, they would hold, um, I think, six, um, six, 60 gallons or something like that. They were they were able to um, they were able to hold literally what our body can hold. So they they were they were six gallon jugs or I, I don't have the exact translation. Maybe somebody has it here, but they were big enough to hold uh, water like a human body. And the point is and the point that God was making here was that we are like the water pot. And in order to experience any miracle in our life, what God wants to do is he wants to bring his transforming power in our life. And how he does that is as we fill our lives, we're the vessel, we're the water pot because we're vessels of clay, right? We're the water pot and God will fill us up with his word. And as we allow ourselves to be filled up with the word of God, all the way to the brim, that's when the water turned into wine. The water never turned into wine when the water was just at the bottom of the vessel. The water didn't turn into wine when it was a quarter of the way filled. The water didn't turn into wine when it was halfway filled. The water didn't turn into wine when it was three quarters filled. The water turned into wine when the water came up all the way to the brim. Jesus said, fill the water pots with water up to the brim, which is the top that that where your head is, you fill the water pot with water up to the top. And when you fill up to the top, that means water. The, the word of God is the water. The water represents the word of God, according to the Bible. As the as you're filled up with the word of God, it's got to get into your heart. Then it's got to be coming out of your mouth. Then it's got to be something that is filling up your ears. Then it's got to be something that's filling up your eyes. It's something we need to be listening to all the time seeing all the time, speaking all the time. And then it's got to get into our head where it's what we're thinking all the time. And as you less as you fill up on the word of God to where it's coming out of your mouth all the time, you're hearing it all the time, you're seeing it all the time, you're thinking it all the time. That's when the water turns into wine. That's when the word going in, which might go in boring. It's like the water. Water's not pop. Water's not wine. Water isn't something that makes you necessarily feel good right away. It's water as you drink the water, as you come to church on Sunday, maybe you won't feel good as I'm pouring water into your vessel. Maybe it won't change you instantly as I'm pouring water into your vessel. But if you let the water keep pouring and keep pouring, show up on Wednesday, show up next Sunday, show up on Wednesday, show up the following Sunday, show up on Good Friday, show up on Easter Sunday, show up on the Sunday after Easter, not just the Sunday of Easter. And as you continue to fill up and through the week, reading the Bible, speaking God's word, the water is going to turn into wine. Water going in from the boring preacher is going to be just water, but it's the word of God and it's the word of God and it's the word of God. And it, it gets to your brim. Suddenly it's going to become wine. And soon you're going to be like, whoa, I didn't know what hit me. Whoa, the power of God hit me. Amen. 
all of a sudden you're going to be stumbling in a good way. You're going to be like, whoa, this makes me feel really good. What just happened? The water turned into wine. All of a sudden, after hearing the word for several weeks in a row, all of a sudden you're going to start feeling happiness and joy. And you're going to go, wow, how did that happen? Because water got turned into wine. All of a sudden, healing is going to show up in your body. You've been hearing the word and nothing happened. Hearing the word and nothing happened. Hearing the word and nothing happened. And then all of a sudden, after weeks and weeks of hearing the word, what happens? The water turns into wine and healing shows up. The water turns into wine and a good marriage shows up. Water turns into wine and the financial breakthrough shows up. Water turns into wine and the depression leaves and the joy comes. But you got to fill up to the brim. All the way to the top to where that's all you're thinking about. That's how God does miracles. Amen. The miracle of transformation. Well, now we're going to talk about the miracle of God's grace. In John chapter six, as we continue in this chapter, I want you to see something amazing that happens after he turns the five loaves, after he multiplies the five loaves and the two fish. What happens next? It says in verse 15 that Jesus, therefore, perceiving in his in his mind and knowing that they were going to take him by force to make him king, departed again to the mountain by himself alone. Verse 16. Now, when evening had come, his disciples went down to the sea and after getting into a boat, verse 17, they began to go over the sea toward Capernaum. So they get in the boat. Jesus is not in this boat with them. This is not the same story as in Mark chapter four. It's a similar story to Mark chapter six. When the storm hits the second time, Jesus is not in the boat. In Mark chapter four, Jesus was in the boat. These are two different occurrences. They're not the same. So he gets so the disciples get into the boat and they begin to travel across the sea toward Capernaum and it was already dark. So it had become dark when they got into the boat, but Jesus had not yet come to them. Now, I want to encourage you today that it was dark, it says in verse 17, when they got into the boat and when they were over the sea towards Capernaum, by this time it was dark and Jesus was not yet there or he wasn't there. Anyone ever felt like that? It's dark and God hasn't seemed to show up in your life. It's dark and it feels heavy and it feels confusing and you feel uncertain and you feel like you don't know where to turn and it's dark and you can't see very far and it's dark and it begins to make you afraid. Has anybody ever been in a dark moment, a dark time emotionally, a dark time financially, a dark time in your marriage, a dark time in your own soul? Has anybody know what I'm talking about, what it feels like to to be in the middle of darkness? They were in darkness. It was dark and Jesus wasn't with them. You can imagine the fear that they must have felt at this point. We all know what it's like to go through dark times. I don't know what you learned when you were a kid, but we all were taught not to be afraid of the dark. The problem is not everybody is is free from that fear. We all know what it's like to be searching for the light in a dark room. We've all been there, that feeling of uncertainty. We all have faced dark moments. Sometimes there are moments. Sometimes there's there are months. Seasons where it seems as if darkness is hovering over our soul. And over our situation. When I speak of darkness, I'm speaking of uncertain times, times of discouragement, times when it seems like there's no hope. It seems like God is not there. It seems like we're not making any progress. Reminds me of the little boy who was afraid of the dark and his mother turned to him. And one day they were cleaning up in the kitchen. It was at nighttime and the little boy asked the the mother asked the little boy to go to the back porch to find the broom. The Little boy turned to his mother and he said, Mama, I don't want to go out there. It's dark. His mother smiled reassuringly to her son and said, oh, darling, you don't have to be afraid of the dark. He said, why not? And she said, because Jesus is there, he'll look out for you. He'll look after you and protect you. Jesus is out there. The little boy looked at his mother real hard and he asked, are you sure he's out there? 
And she said, yes, I'm sure, my child, he is everywhere. He is always ready to help you when you need him, she said. He thought about it for a minute, then went to the back door and just crept up to the back door, cracked it open just a little, stuck his head outside, and without going too far, he yelled, Jesus, if you're out there, could you hand me the broom? <laughs> How many know he will? You don't have to be afraid of the dark. He's there. I think it's in Psalm 139 where it says, to him... Darkness and light are the same. To God, darkness and light are the same. Because he is all light. So to him, he's not affected by darkness because he's all light. He brings the light wherever he goes. To him, darkness and light are the same. It's something we might see differently. It's something that we might measure. It's something that we might be afraid of, but he's not. And as we study and learn from this passage of miracles here, you don't ever have to be afraid again. You may be in a situation right now that seems dark emotionally, financially, in your family, where God seems far away. Darkness is not something God is unfamiliar with, though. He's faced it many times. And if you look through the Bible, you'll see that he has mastered it every time. He thrives in dark times. He does his best work there. In fact, darkness is the stage upon which God performs his most stunning acts and his most stunning works of power in the midst of darkness. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, it says, Darkness covered the deep waters, but the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. And then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. Notice it was in the middle of the darkest moment in the world's history in the universe, in the darkest time in the universe, when darkness covered the entire earth and hovered over the seas, God spoke and said, let there be light, because the Holy Spirit was always there. And no matter how dark your situation is right now, the Holy Spirit is there. Amen. And when you speak the word like he spoke the word, light shows up. Things change. Darkness flees. Amen. You know, as I think about um, this passage of Scripture in John chapter 6, and I see these disciples, and if we, if we just can journey together in this boat with these disciples and kind of picture ourselves there and walk with Jesus when he performed these miracles, if we can, if we can talk about this let me take you through and show you something. If you go to verse 18, it says, And the sea began to be stirred. It arose because a great wind was blowing. And when that word says great wind, this is not just a, a little windy city of Chicago. This is not just some wind. This is uh, the word great there is the word mega. The Greek word comes from the word mega. It is a mega wind. It is it is typhoon-like winds. It is, it, is, uh, uh, it, it is a tsunami type wind. It is a great storm that was blowing, not just a few little waves of water beating against their boat. This is a huge storm. And it says that the, it was, the sea was, was stirred up and strong winds blowing. Now I want to uh, just alert you to, to something here. The, the fear that must have been begun to stir up in these disciples. Because let me tell you something. It says in verse um, 19, when therefore they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near the boat and, they, and of course, they were afraid. They were afraid at all that was happening. And if we can talk about this, I'd like to tell you there are four things in this story that caused fear. Number one, and tr it's true that there are four things in our story that will cause fear at times as well. There were four things that caused fear in this story. Number one, it was dark. Darkness can cause fear. It, we, as we, we already illustrated how 
uh, how fear, fearful feelings can sweep over our heart when it's dark and when you can't see when there is no light and no one should be out when it's really, really dark by themselves in the streets where there is uh, lots of, of things that could happen where you can't where you can't see where you're going and you can't see who's coming. Darkness can cause fear. That's the first thing that um, caused fear in these disciples life. The second thing that caused fear was there was a great storm. There was a mega storm. Storms can cause fear. Remember, this is a massive storm that could hit suddenly at any moment in the sea that they were traveling on. They were caught in a violent storm. Has anybody been through a storm in their life or two? Have you, has anybody going through one right now? Anybody going through such a hard storm? You can't even lift your hand to answer. Yes, that's me. The fact is, is that that was the second thing that caused fear. Number one, it was dark. Number two, there was a great storm. Number three, Jesus was not with them. Listen, when 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 a person is without Jesus, anything's going to bring fear in their life. No matter what the situation is, you're going to be a person who's living in fear continually without Jesus. Any situation minus Jesus equals fear and any situation plus Jesus equals peace. No matter what situation you're in, if you if you have Jesus living in you, if Jesus is your savior and Lord, no matter what you're going through, no matter what the situation is, good or bad, tough or easy, dark or light. If you have Jesus, you're going to have peace if you know he's with you without him, you're going to be afraid and without the knowledge of his presence, you're going to be afraid. Fear sweeps over the heart of the person in the dark, in a storm without Jesus. But then there's a fourth thing that caused fear in these disciples this day, and that was they rode about three or four miles. Now, I don't know if anybody has a Bible with maps. Most people don't have Bibles with maps anymore. They have Bibles with apps nowadays. Right. But I still believe in a Bible with maps. And there's something really great about this because I studied this story in the maps. And if you go to one of the maps that has Capernaum in there and where they started and where they were going and it says they were three or four miles out in the water, you'll find that three or four miles out was only halfway to the other side. The other side, the total distance from the side they took off from to the side that they were trying to get to was about seven to eight miles wide. And there was no shortcuts and there was no other way to get to the other side except crossing that sea. And they had gotten halfway across. Anybody been halfway across the Atlantic Ocean in a plane or the Pacific Ocean in a plane? And all of a sudden there's turbulence that's that makes you a little uncertain. And all of a sudden the plane goes like this. I've been in planes like that that go like this. I have been in planes. I told you the other day a few weeks ago I've been in planes that almost crash. I've been at least in, in at least two planes that almost crashed that were for, that, that had it not been for the Lord who was on my side. Right. And um, and 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 I'm telling you right now, we all know that feeling that the plane drops like this and your cup of coffee or your Coke that you're um, drinking, hopefully not doing anything else with. <laughs> it flies off of the you know, the, the 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 plate that you pull down from the seat in front of you. Listen, folks, you know what that's like. That's what these guys were feeling. Number one, it was dark. Number two, it was a storm. Number three, Jesus wasn't with them. And number four, they're halfway across and they are not making any further progress. They can't go any further. They are stuck halfway. They can't go back. They can't go forward. They're stuck. They're about to drown. It's really frustrating and can be really fearful when you are rowing and rowing and rowing and rowing and not making any progress. You're struggling and struggling and struggling and not making any progress that can bring fear when you keep doing the thing that you know to do. Row, row, row your boat and you are not going gently down any stream and you certainly are not merrily, 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 merrily 
right? Life is not but a dream. It's a nightmare. These are the four things that caused fear in the disciples. They had rode three or four miles in six to nine hours from from darkness to dawn. It was between six and nine hours. They had gotten halfway across. The deepest part of the water is halfway across. The most dangerous water is halfway across. The darkest hour halfway across at three in the morning, two in the morning, one in the morning. It is dark. It is a storm. Jesus isn't with them and they're rowing and not getting any further. Anybody ever been there where you're struggling and you're circling, but you're not getting anywhere? You're circling the mountain. What does it say in Deuteronomy chapter one? It says, excuse me, Deuteronomy chapter two, verse one through three. God says to the children of Israel, it was a it was a 40 day, excuse me, it was an 11 day journey from the wilderness to the promised land. And the Bible says after 40 years, I don't know if you heard that it was an 11 day journey from the wilderness to the promised land. But after 40 years, the children of Israel were still circling around the mountain and around the mountain. And they kept going around it and around it and around it and around it. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be circling around the same old mountain all the time. I don't want to circle around that mountain of sickness. I don't know what mountain you're circling around. But God says in Deuteronomy chapter two, verse one through three, he says, you have circled this mountain long enough. Now it's time to turn north. Now it's time to make an impact. Now it's time to get where you where you're supposed to be. Are you tired of circling around your mountains today? Because we're going to find the miracle power of God to get us to the other side. Listen, God is as tired of you struggling as you are. He's more interested in seeing things change in your life than you are. God has something greater in store for you than what's at the bottom of the mountain and in the middle of the sea. We've accepted and tolerated the middle of the sea life. Storms and darkness and without Jesus. We've tolerated that long enough. We've accepted and tolerated life in mediocrity and in failure and in defeat. And we don't have to settle for that life anymore. And there's one reason why we haven't. There's one reason why we've settled for where we're at, because we've struggled and we've struggled and we've rode and we've rode for, he said, for three to four miles and they've gotten nowhere after nine hours. They're only halfway across and they can't get any further. Maybe you're struggling and you're rowing to try to get past a marriage problem and you can't seem to get past it to get past a financial problem. But you keep struggling to get past a physical health problem. But you keep struggling and you can't get to the other side. You know, I think about. How. When we get stuck. Sometimes we make excuses for why we're there. You know, I mean, I get it. Your weight gain was because you had a baby. I get that. But the baby's 21 now. <laughs> it's, it's, it's time to. Stop using that excuse. <laughs> You've circled the mountain long enough. What that person did to you. You've circled that mountain long enough. You've circled around that sickness long enough. You've circled around that debt long enough. You've circled around dating Bubba long enough. (laughs) Bubba doesn't pay his bills. Bubba doesn't eat out of his own refrigerator. Bubba doesn't have his own refrigerator. So Bubba comes over to your house and eats out of your refrigerator. He plays on your iPhone. He plays games when he should be looking for a job. He's playing Space Invaders on your iPhone. Stop circling around Bubba, hoping Bubba changes. Bubba ain't changing. He hadn't been to church in four weeks. He hasn't been given. He hasn't been serving. He doesn't volunteer for anything. And you're praying for a miracle in Bubba. You, you, it's easier to pray for a miracle of finding somebody else than finding Bubba to change. Stop trying to get Bubba to change and believe that there's lots of good fish in the sea. 
Come on, sister, where are you who've been circling around Bubba too long? It's time to stop circling around that mountain. It's time to give up on Bubba. Don't give up on yourself and don't give up on God and don't blame yourself for the reason Bubba doesn't change. Bubba doesn't change because Bubba doesn't want to change. Bubba isn't staying the same because you did something. You're not the one making Bubba stay the same. You're not the reason that's going to get Bubba to change. If Bubba doesn't change because he wants to, Bubba ain't changing. Stop circling around Bubba. Amen. Stop struggling. You've been praying, oh God, heal me. And you're struggling. Man, I, okay, I'm going to stop this in my life, Lord, and maybe you'll heal me. And I'll stop this, and I'll stop this. And we just keep struggling. We just keep rowing the oars. But we're not getting anywhere. That's what was happening here with these disciples. We keep struggling to change, and we don't seem to change. We're like Paul in, in Romans chapter 7. What I want to do, I don't end up doing, and what I, what I don't, what I shouldn't do, I end up doing. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of the flesh? Thanks be to, to God, who my, through my Lord Jesus Christ, who will deliver me. And now there is therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ. He gets out of the wilderness of Romans chapter 7 by coming into Romans chapter 8 and starting with there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And if God be for me, who can be against me? And he that did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not also with him freely give me all things? I said there's four things that cause fear in these disciples, but there are two things that deliver these disciples from fear. And these are the two things that will deliver you from fear. So when they rode about three or four miles, they're halfway, they're in the middle of the sea, the unsafest, da most dangerous place, and they see Jesus walking on the sea, drawing near the boat, and they were afraid. And it says in verse 20, but he said to them, it is I, don't be afraid. It is I, do not be afraid. It is I. That word translated, it is I, literally means I am. Do not be afraid. I am. Do not be afraid. Go back to verse 19. It said they saw Jesus. And what was he doing? He was walking on the sea. What was their problem? The water of the sea. The wind and the water of the sea was their problem. But they see Jesus. And what is he doing? He's walking on the sea. He's walking on their problem. He's on top of the situation, folks. He's on top of your problem. He's on top of the situation. He's walking on top of it. It's under his feet. That's where the devil is, under your feet. That's where your problem is, under your feet. Stop worrying about what's over you and stop realizing you're the head and not the tail. You're above only and not beneath. And Jesus starts walking on the sea, showing them whatever has been bothering you and whatever you've been afraid of, I'm walking on top of it to show you that I have dominion over this thing and you have dominion over this thing. And so he's walking on the sea. And notice what he's doing. He is coming toward them. This is amazing to me. This is the miracle of God's grace. The miracle is not that he's walking on the water. That's easy for him. He made the water. He can walk on whatever he wants to walk on. The miracle, it is a miracle that he's walking on water, don't get me wrong. It is a miracle, but it's not the miracle here. Let me show you the miracle. He's walking on the water toward them in their storm, in their darkness, and in their fear. He's coming towards them. They didn't even ask. They didn't even pray. Where's all their praying and fasting to get God to move? That's the law, that you have to pray and fast to get God to move, when what you really need to do is realize He's moving. And you know where He's moving? Toward you all the time. This is the miracle of God's grace. They weren't even praying. They weren't even fasting. They weren't even, uh, they weren't even people that were, I mean, living holy or godly lives for all we know. All we know is this, is that God, is that Jesus saw them struggling and came to them. And I want you to know when you're struggling, he's not sitting on the sidelines. When you're struggling, he's not sitting at the dock of the bay watching the tide roll away. <laughs> 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 
He's coming towards you. It's coming towards you. That's grace. It's always coming towards you. God's always coming to you. God's always coming at you. God's always coming for you. God's always coming with you. God's always coming to you to heal you, to deliver you, to rescue you, to show you that he does not leave you alone in your struggle in midnight hour. He's always coming to you. That's the miracle here. It's not that he's walking on the water. It's what direction he's going in. And he's never walking away from you in your time of struggle. He's not running from you in your time of struggle. When we're faithless, he remains faithful. We, when, we're, when, we, when we give up, he never gives up on us. When we're drowning, he doesn't let us sink. This is grace. He's coming toward them. He's coming toward them. He's coming toward them. He's coming toward them. And then, see, really it's three things here, I guess, that deliver us from fear. One is to know that he's always coming towards you. And the second thing is in verse 20, and he spoke to them and said, it is I. He spoke to them. The word of God delivers us from fear. He spoke to them. He spoke to them. He spoke to them. He spoke to them. God's always speaking. Are you listening? Are you letting the water fill your water pot? And then, verse 21, the third thing that delivers them from fear. Then they willingly received him into the boat. Notice, they willingly received him into the boat. He's always coming towards you. He's always speaking over you. And he's always walking with you. His presence will deliver you from fear. What delivered Joseph when he was thrown into a pit and then sold as a slave in Potiphar's house? How did God call him a prosperous man after he was stripped of everything and made into a slave? Because God was with him. And true prosperity is not a colored coat. True prosperity is not a position over your brothers. True prosperity is not having a family that talks good about you. True prosperity for Joseph was it says God was with him. Therefore, he was a prosperous man. It was God's presence that made him a prosperous man. He didn't have any money, but he had God's presence. He didn't have a coat, but he had God's presence. He didn't have his brothers anymore because they betrayed him, but he had God's presence. I don't know what you don't have right now, but you got to take inventory of what you do have because you have God's presence in the middle of your darkness, in the middle of your storm, in the middle of your trouble. You have the presence of God and the presence of God will always get you to the other side. And then watch this. And they willingly received him into the boat. And here's our part. God's always walking towards us. That's grace. God's always speaking his words over us. That's grace. But then our part is simply this. They willingly received they willingly received they willingly received it's not what they achieved it's what they received it's not what they accomplished it's what they received that this life of faith and this life of God's grace is not about what we can do to get God to do something but God is always coming toward us God is always speaking over us and our part is to willingly receive it's not pay you can't pay anything to get God to move in your life you can't fast enough to get God to move in your life you can't pray Pray hard enough to get God to move in your life. Here's how you receive from God. Here's how a miracle happens. Whatever miracle you need in your family, whatever miracle you need in your finances, whatever miracle you need in your home, freely and willingly receive. Don't be stubborn and think you got to do it yourself. Don't be stubborn and put your pride in your accomplishments and how much you did and how much you've done and how much you've prayed and how much you've fasted and how much holiness you've tried to achieve because they didn't receive anything because of what they achieved. He came towards them. They didn't even ask. He spoke over them. They didn't even ask. And they simply willingly received. If you want a miracle from God in any area of your life, just willingly receive it. It's a gift. First Corinthians chapter 12 calls miracles a gift from God. It's a gift. It's a gift. It's a gift. Willingly receive. What's our part? willingly receive. What's his part? He comes towards you. What's his part? He speaks over you. What's your part? Willingly receive. Willingly receive. 
And when they willingly received him into the boat, remember where they were? Three to four miles, they were halfway across. You study your maps yourself, they were halfway across. They weren't getting to the other side without him. They were going to drown without him. And they willingly received him into the boat. And when they willingly received, immediately. This is the miracle. When they willingly received, immediately they were at the land where they were going. Wait a minute. It took them nine hours to get stuck. And yet immediately, when Jesus came toward them, Jesus spoke over them, they simply received. That's grace. And they were there. Who needs to get there? When you have him here, you will be there. When you have him here, you will be there. Because you have him here, you're there. All you've got to do is find out what he says and know that he's coming towards you and just open your arms. You know, to me, worship, when we open our arms, it's an act of receiving. You know, when you lift your hands, it's an act of receiving. If you come and worship and you're like this, well, I don't do that. You know, I'm not one of those crazy holy rollers at Life Changers. Those are crazy people. Man, they roll around the floor. They do all sorts of weird things. They spit up vomit. First of all, we don't do that. <laughs> you got to go to some other church if you want people sp spitting up vomit. But when you close your arms like that, it's not that you, God doesn't love you. It's not that God is, it's not that God's looking at you and saying, what's the matter with you? How come you're not more reverent? How come you're not more holy? How come you're not more godly? Why don't you lift your hands like a crazy folks? No, it's that you're just saying you don't, you're not opening yourself up to receive. When you go like this, you're, you're in receiving mode. Imagine if I was a wide receiver on the Chicago Bears. Scratch that, the New England Patriots. And I run out on the route that the playbook calls for, and I go out to my position, and I go like this. Or like this. Now, he's never throwing it to me anyway. Or if he does, it's going over my head. If it's Jay Cutler, it's not coming near me. No, I'm just kidding, Jay. I love you, Jay. Come to church and you'll be better. But, but you can't receive like this. You got to open up. They willingly received him. And bam, they were there. Receive his word and bam. It's yours. Well, I don't know if I believe all that. I think we got to struggle more. Really? You've been struggling. To get, all you've gotten there is halfway across and you're about to drown. You want to keep struggling and really be holy? Then die. <laughs> Receive. This is grace. This is the miracle of grace. They couldn't get there in their own struggle. But when they got him in there, when they received him willingly, that's why, man, when it comes to giving and praying, it, it should be, you should want to do it. It shouldn't be like, I have to do it. When you willingly give, that's when miracles happen. When you willingly receive, that's when miracles happen. Let's stand together. We're out of time here. Man, I hope this makes sense to somebody today. When they received Jesus willingly, they immediately were there. This is the miracle of God's grace. An old poem says it this way. Thou framer of the light and dark, steer through the tempest thine own ark. Amid the howling wintry sea, we are at port if we have thee. That's the miracle of God's grace. Amid the howling wintry sea, we are at port when we have thee. 
amidst the howling wintry sea, we are at our destination immediately when we have Thee. God's presence is God's grace. It makes all the difference.